Welcome to a cult of personality, esoteric podcast extraordinaire at a cult of personality.net. I'm your host, Greg Kaminsky. A cult of personality podcast is available on iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher Radio, Acast, and all the best podcast apps. This is episode 171, featuring an interview with Danny Newman, who specializes in entheogenic symbolism in Masonic ritual. The Cult of Personality podcast is made possible by you, the listeners, and by the subscribers to the Occult of Personality membership section and our patrons who participate via the Occult of Personality Patreon campaign. I'd like to remind you that although you're able to listen to this podcast at no charge, the costs for me to bring it to you are significant. Your financial contributions make sure this free podcast continues. Please support a cult of personality by joining the membership section or donating via the donate button on the occult of personality.net website or via Patreon at patreon.com slash occult of personality. Our Patreon page now features an exclusive RSS feed for patrons, meaning that if you subscribe via Patreon, to support the show, you will get some extra content just for you. And if you're already supporting the show, or have done so in the past, my heartfelt thanks, and I salute you. A Cult of Personality podcast is also sponsored by Miskatonic Books, an online store that focuses on the esoteric, occult, ceremonial magic, Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, witchcraft, the Golden Dawn, as well as dark fantasy, classic horror, and supernatural fiction. They carry books by all your favorite esoteric publishers as well. Just visit MiskatonicBooks.com. Temple of Thelema is a true outer order of the greater mysteries, providing ceremonial initiation, structured training, and regular group work, all in conformity with the principles of the Book of the Law. An investment of time, effort, and commitment is expected from each member. Each is expected to aspire fervently to the great work, to dare, with courage undaunted, to perfect that work and ever to apply his or her best effort to effect harmony within the order and within the world in general. Founded in service to the AA, College of Thelema seeks to guide the student to an understanding of the law of Thelema. Most especially, this means a deeper understanding of oneself and of one's true will. A combination of instruction techniques is employed, including seminars, written texts, and individual work. For over 40 years, College of Thelema has published journals in the Continuum and Black Pearl, as well as several books on occult subjects maintaining high standards in Thelemic education. Visit Temple of Thelema at www.thelema.org. In episode number 171, an interview with Danny Newman about his research into the intersection of psychedelics and initiation. P.D. Newman is a Scottish Rite Freemason and a Masonic Rosicrucian. The focus of his research 
is on the presence of entheogenic symbolism within Masonic ritual. He has had papers published by a variety of Masonic periodicals and popular websites. His book, Alchemically Stoned, The Sprig of Acacia and the Psychedelic Secret of Freemasonry, is planned for release in 2017. Alchemically Stoned, The Sprig of Acacia and the Psychedelic Secret of Freemasonry is a groundbreaking work which explores the ceremonial use of the powerful entheogen dimethyltryptamine, DMT, within Masonic ritual. The sprig of acacia is an important symbol within Freemasonry, but unbeknownst even to the fraternity's own initiates, the acacia is rich in more than just symbolism. Newman details the actual use of acacia-produced DMT by alchemically inclined Freemasons as early as 1762. His premise challenges everything we think we know about the history, nature, and aims of the Masonic fraternity. And if you support Newman's work, be sure to hit the GoFundMe page for his book, listed in the show notes. Now, I confess that I was a bit under the weather during the recording, and despite my efforts to be open-minded and let guests express themselves unencumbered, I did not quite manage that in this instance. However, Newman acquitted himself rather well, and he makes a strong case for entheogenic symbolism. But you'll have to make up your own mind as to the accuracy of his claims. And if you do accept the historical validity, then what, if any, is the modern implication? Danny Newman, I want to welcome you to Occult of Personality podcast. It's a pleasure to speak with you tonight. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited about the interview. Yeah, same, same here. Uh, why don't we begin uh, by having you give us a little bit of your background in esotericism and how you became interested in all this stuff? Uh, I was raised um, Southern Baptist in Mississippi, so uh, I wasn't really exposed to anything esoteric as a as a kid. But uh, there's a there's a big um, uh, mushroom kind of psychedelic scene going on in the deep south because they they grow wild everywhere and somewhere around age 11 or 12 we started experimenting with mushrooms learned how to pick mushrooms and it was those experiences that really led uh originally my brother and i into a lot of different esoteric territories like uh, yoga and uh, ceremonial magic and Odd uh, things like that that came about just through mainly through curiosities that were peaked from from those psychedelic experiences and I guess uh, I, I had a particularly profound experience on uh, on mushrooms that led me to the decision that I would kind of set aside psychedelic exploration for a while and pursue more traditional avenues of initiation and that led me to freemasonry in 2010 i guess is when i became a master mason and uh, shortly thereafter i was invited to join sricf which is a, a masonic rosicrucianism uh and not long after i became a scottish rite mason and a knight templar and i was just gung-ho for a long time and uh, it wasn't until you know i'd been a mason for i guess a year or longer that i really started to give a double take to uh, you know the acacia symbolism and and some of the other symbolism that popped up that really uh, those investigations were what led me to uh, where I am now you know with these what I think are pretty significant discoveries regarding especially acacia and DMT its use in Freemasonry right right well why don't we lay it out for us if you don't mind your give us your argument your thesis and and uh, I, I think it's a pretty interesting one. We'll let the listeners 
<laughs> be the judge of the, it. Particularly the, the DMT um, argument. Yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, the DMT, the acacia, the Freemasonry, I think, you know, it's pretty, <laughs> it's, if nothing else, it's kind of compelling and uh, I think makes people think, or I would hope so anyway. Sure, yeah, no problem. Um, well, of, of course, you know, Freemasons aren't using DMT and Lodge now or in a Masonic context, but, and Certainly. I don't believe that they were earlier in a, in a, you know, under the UGLE or any of these other major organizations. But I do believe that by the time that uh, we had people like, um, first off, we see it with Melisino um, comes along in, I think, 1762. He was a Russian, um, I don't think he was a general. He was something in, in the Russian army, uh, and he was a Freemason and wrote the, the Melisino right. And in this rite, he specifically talks about producing uh, a stone from acacia, which he calls treasures, somewhere in the text also. Uh, and he talks about, um, he identifies the stone as being the same stone that was placed to Isaiah's lips whenever he saw these visions of, uh, of heaven, I suppose. Uh, <coughs> and uh, aside from... Aside from uh, the DMT present in Acacia, I just can't perceive of any other reason why he would be doing this, why he would be saying, uh, identifying uh, the Acacia itself as the primal matter of alchemy and then further identifying the, the stone itself as being this compound that he produces from it that he identifies as being the same as the stone placed to uh, Isaiah's lips. And what really becomes interesting is in the book of Isaiah, in this verse he mentions, the angel says, uh, thine iniquity has been purged. And if you look up Acacia and, and Mackey's Encyclopedia and a couple of other texts, they, they translate Acacia as being uh, Greek for innocence, which is purged of iniquity, uh, absence of iniquity. So uh, that's a pretty interesting uh, coincidence there. And not long after this, we see Cagliostro show up. And Cagliostro and Melisino were known to be friends. They, they supported each other's work. And met. Uh, we know Cagliostro met Melisino when he went to Russia. And, and you know, uh, his trip to Russia is documented in the whole, uh, what's that, Diamond Necklace movie or whatnot with Christopher Walken. Uh, but in and in, in Cagliostro's right and his what he calls his Egyptian right, even though it's not uh, Egyptian per se, um, he has his initiates drink a concoction of acacia, and he tells them again, this is the primal matter. And I suspect he got this from Melisino, <clears throat> if not from uh, the right of strict observance, which is what the form of masonry they were both they both became master masons in together. Uh, I I don't think in the same country, but they were both initiates of the right of strict observance. <laughs> so Cagliostro has his his initiates drink this concoction of acacia and tells them that it's to raise their their spirits in order to understand this lecture he's about to give them. Um, I, I guess because of the profundity he, he encoded or, you know, put in within this. And for, for anyone who doesn't know that the big thing about DMT is it's it's a uh, it's not alien to uh, mystical practices. There's there's there several indigenous communities that use this stuff from uh, in the form of what's called ayahuasca. It's a uh, it's DMT mixed with another compound that makes it orally active. It lasts up to six hours in that 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 way. But if you smoke it, it only lasts about twenty to twenty five minutes. And you also have it in the form of snuffs, such as like Yopo, which is Y-O-P-O, if anyone wants to Google that, or Epina, which I think is E-P-E-N-A. And these are DMT snuffs that are made from you know, calcinated shells and bones that make it uh, you know, absorb into the mucous membranes in the nasal cavity and make it active that way. But uh, this stuff isn't unknown, and it really, really starts to get interesting when... Rick Strassman, you know, he put out his book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. And, it, you know, that that's really what got everybody interested in, in DMT in the first place, because, you know, the movie came out afterwards, the documentary. 
But what nobody mentioned in the documentary was if you read in the introduction, that might be in the preface, it's in the very front of the book, you know, Strassman says that he's, this research was funded from a grant from the Scottish Rite. And uh, I've, I've never been able to get anyone in, in the Scottish Rite to tell me, you know, w- what the interest in this was, and especially, you know, how, how it relates to the symbolism of the acacia and the Master Mason degree. But it certainly starts to look like we have more than just a few coincidences lining up here. And oh, yeah. like I said, I don't think the early, I don't think the early Masons were necessarily using the acacia in this context, because if we look at the earliest degrees, um, we, it doesn't say acacia, it says cassia. And granted, cassia is a phonetic anagram of acacia, so it could just be a blind. So we don't see acacia show up until around 19, uh, excuse me, until around the 1730s. So it makes you wonder if acacia was changed to acacia because of its relevance, the DMT content, or if we just had people like Cagliostro and Melissino come along later and say, hey, you know, we could, uh, I guess, transvalue weight this and, and bend it to our own ends because we're aware of this compound that's present in it. And I'm sure they might have believed that, that was the function of the symbol in the first place, but that's, you know, we can only speculate. But that's really the heart of the DMT argument in Freemasonry. Wow, you've really given us a lot to to think about there in just a very short period of a few minutes. Um, if you don't mind, maybe we could just back up a little bit because um, I'm not sure, sure yeah. I'm not sure people listening are even following everything that you, you just said. So um, one of the things I wonder is if you could just briefly, if you're able to, um, talk about the symbol of Freemason, uh, I'm sorry, the symbol of Acacia in Freemasonry now, and um, and then maybe from there just talk about um, other instances that it's mentioned uh, in the Bible. I know, you know, there's, aside from the Isaiah, you know, there's the Ark of the Covenant, and there's probably a lot of others. <laughs> sure, yeah, the, it's mentioned in as being the wood used in the Ark of the, Ark of the Covenant. It's mentioned as being uh, used in the building of uh, Noah's Ark. Um, it's referenced in, in some versions uh, of uh, the Rose Croy degree that the cross was made out of acacia. Now, I, I've been told, and I, I don't know this myself, but, but I've been told that um, acacia wood was so valued in desert climates because it... Um, the grain was so tight that it was impervious to rot or infestation of any sort. So that's why you know you would have you would have carried the Ark of the Covenant if there was such a physical thing in that sort yeah, of I wouldn't, I wouldn't type of doubt. wood. Yeah. It also is a food source. Um, that's where we get Arabic gum, acacia gum. Um, that, that's a, a staple and lots of Middle Eastern dishes, and it's also used in a lot of incenses and things. Uh, I, I did have a recipe um, used in one Masonic order that called for acacia itself, but it wouldn't be in any amount that would have caused a, a reaction. I mean, just acacia powder itself, it would have taken massive, massive amounts of it. Huh. But its significance in Freemasonry... Uh, the, it, it, it comes into play with the central myth or allegory of Freemasonry, which is the story of Hiram Abyss. Uh, Hiram was the architect, the grand architect of the Temple of Solomon, and one of the grand masters, the original three grand masters um, of Freemasonry. And uh, it was his custom to go up at noon and draw up his temples, his uh, plans for the temple on his tracing board, and on his way to do this, he encounters three ruffians, which, <coughs> without going into that, uh, there's obviously deep symbolism in the three ruffians and their names. And, um, but uh, what they do, essentially, is they say, give us, the, give us the master's word, and he tells them, I can't, you know, I can't give this to you because this isn't the proper way to receive it. If you're worthy of it, you will eventually receive it yourself. 
and they demand it and essentially kill him for it and he dies and they hide his body and before the body is discovered um, they want to uh, come back and bury it properly but it's just in the hurry in the scurry of the moment <laughs> bury it under this rubble under the rubbish heap and they place a sprig of acacia there <laughs> over the grave so that they can find it later and this is essentially how the fellow crafts who come searching for the body find it and they pull out this sprig of acacia and uh, the traditional interpretation of the sprig of acacia is that it rec represents the immortality of the soul because acacia is an evergreen um, and then and some uh, degree, some versions of the degree, it just says evergreen. It doesn't say acacia. <laughs> so it's it's widely accepted that that's the meaning. But what I find fascinating is that the meaning of that evergreen is the same as what happens if you employ acacia in a psychedelic context. When you use DMT, what you get is proof of the soul. What I don't know what else you'd call it when you have an outer body experience, uh, when you realize that you're you're having continuity of consciousness beyond the mortal frame i don't i don't know what else we would call that proof of um and it, sure it could be a, a salacious experience of not really what's happening but the experience is that you are separate and and what we might call an astral form uh, but, so that's the real significance of freemason I mean, it's just as a as as an evergreen that yeah. it was 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 marked marked the grave of where, where Hiram was buried so basically to accept your argument, people would have to identify this symbol which represents the immortality of the soul with a plant substance that can be ingested, sort of, whether it's alchemically or psychedelically or what ha initiatically, I, I don't know how you want to describe it, but essentially to... Um, what have you illuminate your consciousness um essentially producing the immortality of the soul or the experience of that i would imagine um if done in the proper context so i don't think that's completely a uh, far-fetched argument no, but I don't, but I don't think so either I can I can see how some people would be reluctant or resistant to it just on the face of it. You know what I mean? Certainly, yeah. I, I have a number of detractors uh, that argue against this, and and, and, I, and I, I welcome it because um, this is uh, what I what I really want is a dialogue opened about this kind of stuff. We see <clears throat> so many things come into the fore in Freemasonry. People are willing to kind of get back to the esoteric side of what some of this stuff means but no one seems to want to discuss anything about um, psychedelics and, and their relevance as far as a spiritual pursuit or a tool uh, and uh, that's really my goal is to get Freemasons thinking about psychedelics and to get people in the psychedelics thinking about Freemasonry because I feel like there's a lot of crossover there uh, and it's not I'm not saying I want to you know overload lodges with with hippies what i'm saying is you know i want yeah I you're, you're giving me a dialogue. vision you're giving me a vision here that uh yeah <laughs> it, it on one hand it's pretty cool but on the other hand like i can see a lot of uh <clears throat> i don't know what i would say i guess my initial reaction to what you're talking about is uh Man, that just doesn't seem like something that Blue Lodge Masonry is prepared for. Uh, maybe, you know, like you said, like Masonic Rosicrucians or uh, like some Scottish Rite body, you know, but I you know, I don't know. I, I, I can't see it in like mainstream Blue Lodge. I just, well, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. It yeah. shouldn't be a part of the degree work. It shouldn't be anywhere in the lectures. You know, it, it shouldn't be. It, masonry is, is complete in and of itself. This is something we talk about extra um, that might be suggested. And, and even if it's not suggested, we we know that, that certain Masons were interpreting it this way, like Cagliostro and Melusino, and bending it to these ends, to the specific ends. So, 
But it, what I what I find intriguing that... though is in, is to like considering your argument, like when you think of Cagliostro and some of these more esoteric degrees, the inference I think is that or, or implication is that these degrees are like more esoteric more in some ways more authentically interpreting the the symbolism or the meanings and if we think about the biblical symbolism well maybe they're right it, you know yeah, like they, may, maybe you're they right be. they could be i feel like i am right as far as you know Cagliostro and melusino goes at, but i'm not willing to take that leap and say that's what the acacia was put in masonry for. Okay. Um, I, I do have a suspicion that, and, you know, we talked about earlier the right of strict observance that both Cagliostro and Melusino were initiated into, which is was a, a form of the first three degrees. And in their master mason degree, they have a very curiously worded um, phrase, a portion of, of the lecture that comes up when they find the acacia. <clears throat> And the acacia, the ones that do have DMT in them, the DMT is primarily in the root bark of the plant. It's not mainly in the, in the bark on the uh, branchy portion of the tree. It's not really in the leaves. It's in the root bark. Uh, and in their in the their version of the Master Mason degree, they find this acacia and pull it out, and they say, "This has no roots. It must signify something." And before it says that, it says the masons who sought the stone wanted to climb. Now, I'm not sure what stone they're talking about, because it kind of reads like they've mixed it with the Mark Master degree, with the stone that the builders rejected. Right. Um, but it says that the, the, the builders uh, who sought the stone wanted to climb, ascend, is kind of what I think about. Yeah, I mean, I'd automatically can, assume, you know, Jacob's Ladder there. Mm -hmm. They sought the stone, wanted to climb, and then they realized that the acacia had no roots. And I quote, it says, this must signify something. So what does that signify? The fact that it has no roots. Yeah. Hmm. And that's, what it, well, that's why I think um, maybe that's the place to look, right, of strict observance, because that's where both Melusino and Cagliostro came from. And both of them were practicing alchemists and... Uh, you know, several. I've have seen several claims that the right of strict observance were um, practicing alchemists had had active uh, alchemy lodges. I know Hogan makes that claim, uh, right, uh, right, somewhere. Now, do you have any um, evidence pointing to either other esoteric orders aside from irregular masonry or? Maybe, you know, like ancient mysteries would be a good example of, of other groups that were employing these methods as part of their tradition. Not specifically Acacia. Uh, the only places that really shows up in an initiatory context is um, in the Caribbean and the Amazon basin. And, mm -hmm. and it's used um, when, when, a, when a male is going through uh, his puberty rite is used to kill the child to resurrect the man, which is, you know, eerily similar to what we see in Freemasonry. I know it's not a child that's going down, but it's it's the same same kind of idea, resurrecting to something larger. Um, which and, and and for them, being a man isn't isn't as simple as it is. It, it, it for most cultures and these indigenous cultures being a man implies all these other things all these other virtues like spirituality and uh, a lot of the virtues of spouse and freemason right. so you see them use it and they also use it for the shamans when when the shamans are acquiring what they call some cultures call their manas their higher wisdom um, when the shaman ha is going through the ritual ceremony again they'll use even larger amounts of of, of these DMT snuffs or ayahuasca to uh, kill that man and then resurrect him to something more than a man. But I'm, I'm reluctant to call these ancient mysteries. Other ancient mysteries we do see you know, entheogens showing up, which I believe, again, has uh, echoes in Freemasonry. Um, for example, with the Eleusinian mysteries, it's believed that the, uh, the Kekion 
beverage that uh, caused um, you know thousands of people at a time to experience this uh, a vision of the gods or um, of their own immortality because uh, as it says that they they would see themselves uh, in the heavens with the gods and, and the people below them who weren't initiates in the muck beneath their feet and, uh, and in 19 I think it was 1971 um, Carl Ruck who is the professor of classics at Boston University he wrote um, The Road to Eleusis along with uh, R. Gordon Wasson who um, discovered psilocybin mushrooms and uh, Albert Hoffman who synthesized psilocybin and uh, discovered the psychedelic effects of LSD. Well, they they published this book, um, The Road to Eleusis, where they explained that the most probable way to induce this kind of experience for massive amounts of people at a time was to give them a, a psychedelic beverage. And but the the problem has been what was that beverage? And uh, they were the first ones to propose that it was um, ergot because the Eleusinian temple was adjacent is adjacent to what was called the rarian plain this is a, a huge rye field and rye is the it produces um, clavicets purpurea which is one of the sources of ergot <coughs> and so they proposed based on uh, the ingredients for kikion which is provided in um, i think in homer's um, one of homer's pieces um, it's described as being uh, barley growths, um, pennyroyal mint, le- mint leaves, and I think uh, I think just water is the third ingredient. I have to double check, but you know none of those are obviously psychoactive. But when you consider that that the uh, ergot that the rye could have been infested with ergot, then it, it becomes a whole other story. <laughs> so we suspect that the Eleusinian mysteries were using it, and um, the Mithraic mysteries it's suspected they were using mushrooms among other other psychedelics, which they called magical dinners, uh, a series of magical dinners that constituted a large portion of their their grade work. So yeah, we have that. We have a number of, uh, and uh, um, the most obvious would be um, soma with the ancient uh, Vedas and on to. Uh, you know, certain sects of Hinduism and into Vajrayana Buddhism where it becomes Dutsi or and Rita. You know, we still see this use of a, a psychoactive compound that elevates the the user and is used in an initiatory or, or divinatory context. Yeah, I'd like to table that one, if you don't mind, for a few minutes. Sure. Um, and come back to it a little bit later. And if I... F- forget please remind me yeah they both relate to um well, there's sample um chapters from my book that i sent you that we could probably probably touch on with the amanita muscaria mushrooms and, and the ergot yeah you've been a mason for a relatively short period of time <clears throat> yeah yeah that's true and you've joined a number of appendant bodies in masonry and you've published papers you've been given papers on on this very subject that we've talked about as well as others and I, i'm curious uh it seems like you know you've like you said you kind of like jumped in with both feet and really got Involved in terms of the research and understanding the symbolism. But what I'm really fascinated by is it seems like it took you in such a radically different direction than it does most everyone else who goes into this research, at least in Freemasonry. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. I, I have yet to meet, um, I, I've met a few, but not many people that are. Uh, looking in the same directions as am I, but I, I just think it's, you know, like I said, when I came to Freemasonry, I wasn't really looking for any of this stuff. I, I had no idea. I was looking for a traditional avenue of initiation that was uh, relevant uh, within my own culture. But to be clear, you were 
you were already interested in these subjects before masonry. Uh, which subject? Psychedelics? Psychedelics, uh, psychedelics and initiation. and Before I became a mason, I had been studying um, Kabbalah and yoga and mm-hmm. things of that nature for almost a decade. I had been kind of working with um, Alistair Crowley's AA system um, for a while. I kind of cut my teeth on Crowley and uh, Rigardi and all those Golden Dawn guys. So you know, those, I, I've that's, already read that stuff. Yeah, that's some extremely, I would say, in my opinion, extremely powerful um, practices and uh, certainly can put an edge on things, I think. My brother and I went that direction because Crowley was the only guy who was talking about uh, the caliber of experiences we were having and, right. and admitting that part of that it was due in part to these drugs to, in his case, mescaline and hashish, and, you know, and it, it was it, for the first time it was um, validating for us because uh, we were off in the deep end, you know, we didn't have anybody to talk to. And when we'd try and, uh, try and talk to someone that we thought kind of had a grasp of this stuff. Our language was obviously not the same, and we just kept running into these barriers. But but Crowley seemed to uh, to really give us hope that we weren't the only ones, you know, dabbling in this kind of stuff. And then later we found, you know, Terrence McKenna. <laughs> you know, when you first find Terrence McKenna, you feel like you struck gold. Um, but a lot of his ideas really resonated with us when he'd talk about the logos and um, things like that, that we were really, uh, you know, pertinent to our experience at the time. Hmm. But yeah, we had both, my brother and I, my brother's not a Freemason, but he's my, he's my, uh, you know, my partner in crime. He's, <laughs> we're only 14 months apart, so he's, he's always been there, and we've always been each other's guinea pigs for a lot of these things. Now, I have to ask you, because... It sounds like from our conversation so far and previously that these experiences have been expansive and led you in a multi- multitude of directions. But in my experience, there's also the possible. It's like a like you know two sides of a coin. You know, the other side is the, the person and uses the psychedelic and then kind of gets trapped and is like, oh, this this experience itself is it. And then that right, they don't right. really go, that's, they're done, right? And that's the danger, I guess, of it. So it's like a, see, I see it as like a double-sided coin. Other people see it as like, you know, and we've I've talked to them on this show. You know, David Chaim Smith, uh, Craig Williams. I think I would be accurate in saying like they view these things as dangerous, either from a health perspective or from a, a perspective that it can like limit one's either understanding of consciousness or what they're of what the path actually entails or that uh, it can be damaging to the nervous system. I mean, I think there's all kinds of like caveats to these things, which may be true. I'm not saying they're not, but um, what is your reaction to all these things I'm throwing at you? It's the same reactions. It's the same reactions, you know, that most, most psychedelic explorers encounter because uh, people who are dedicated to a path get frustrated when someone tells them that they've had this profound experience by taking a drug. It's, it's, and I, I, I can completely see where they're coming from, but it's frustrating. But to say that it causes any kind of damage, I mean, the research is being done now. We're learning these compounds actually regenerate brain cells and make you use more of your brain than before. And, and I, I would never say that they're dangerous. They've been used by, uh, uh, not not necessarily things like LSD, but things like uh, you know peyote, mushrooms, ayahuasca. These things have been used for untold millennia by humans, and uh, as Wasson suggests, may be the source of religion itself. May be the source of the uh, what he called entheogenesis of religion. And I I, I would 
by that much sooner. And I also think um, that there's this drive to, in the West especially, to experience, um, not, in, not in Western religion, but in Western mysticism, there's this drive to experience this stuff independent of any external sources. Um, out save meditation or something like that and and I, I reject that you know I don't think we do anything in a vacuum I think we do everything in cooperation with nature uh, and I, I think I told you before but I, I feel like any spiritual practice is is man-made is created by man and they might say well it was divinely inspired but the bottom line is man created it but we know that man did not create nature yeah, but I know. but I would also argue that like you you're you're you've got like a you've got a conceptual division between man and nature, and I I would argue that there is none. And to say that that man created it means that it's it is divinely inspired or created because it is created by nature. Because man, despite his dis, despite our attempts to break free and subjugate and separate um we're i don't think you can separate ourselves from nature in that way i agree completely and I, you know and that even you know that even brings up the point you know everything is natural even plastics you know these are all an expression of a natural world and that's not really what i'm what i'm getting at what i'm getting at is more nature itself not not something that, and, and I know the alchemist, the big alchemical axiom that, is that, you know, the alchemist assists nature. And, and I, I, I totally get that. But when you say that these things are dangerous, I don't think they're dangerous to people. They may be dangerous in the context of a certain system. I'll, I'll grant that uh, because what they do is they loosen the bonds of belief structures. So if you're being indoctrinated in a, in a particular system, then yes, they're terribly dangerous. Um, because they they do not allow indoctrination except in one's own gnosis and the vision one has. Like you, and like you said, you do run the risk of having this grandiose vision and saying, "Aha, I've got it," you know. But that can happen with any spiritual discipline, whether it be Kabbalah or yoga or no, that's or true. That's anything. A, that's a valid um, point. Yeah. And, and Crowley, Crowley, just to mention him again, he warned against that. He said, "You know, don't don't mistake the plat the." plateau for the final resting place you know every every glorious revelation we have is there will be an equal and opposite truth revealed at some other point I and mean, that's been kind of true from my own experience you know everything that we feel like oh my goodness uh, uh, this is it um well that's it right then you know but there's another it moment because we are we're more complicated than that there's not one answer truth is i don't think is it's not concrete it's something that's fluid and, and changes with Every breath, you know, it's it's not absolute. I don't think. So no, I don't think they're dangerous. I think that that's. I think it's dangerous to suggest they're dangerous, especially after all the research that's going mm -hmm. um, about their place in, in medicine, psychiatry, spirituality. We're we're at a at a um, a whole new. Uh, uh, I don't even know what to call it. We've never been able to discuss psychedelic compounds um, this freely. <laughs> it's it's in the dialogue of, in a positive context, not a negative one. That's, that's what's so staggering about it. It's never been this in in the media since the '60s, and then there was nothing positive. So I really feel like we're we're at a, a fortunate time to discuss this kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, so, in this kind of leads into my next question about the overall reaction to your material, um, both within masonry and in you know more generally. Um, it's been primarily positive, um, but all the positive reactions have been from people who have experimented with these compounds. Mm -hmm and know the profundity and the girth of the experience they can offer. Uh, but uh, I have experienced, I have encountered a lot of, um, a lot of flack, a lot of, I've gotten hate mail for some of my stuff. And, uh, but I expect that, you know, uh, <clears throat> most of the negative reactions come from, you know, people who 
not just in masonry, but even from um, Golden Dawn circles, you know, different things that I mentioned about Reverend Aiton and, and his use of Selma with the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor, and just different things like that, um, different attacks I've experienced because people don't want to think that, like I said before, they don't want to think that a drug was involved at all. You know, it used to be sex that was terrifying. You know, people were using sex to attain enlightenment, but now the most terrifying thing is drugs. So I do get a lot of uh, of negative reactions. Uh, I'm I'm about to start speaking publicly on on the drug topic. I've speaking publicly speaking publicly on in lodges on things like you know um, Kabbalah and just different Masonic symbols, but never on on the psychedelic. So it's gonna it's gonna be interesting. We'll see what kind of reactions I get in a in a live context. Hmm. That's interesting. I'm curious if you've ever like uh, compared some of the physiological reactions from like like kabbalistic meditations with the the head movements and things like that, or like breathing exercises or different postures. I mean, I'm assuming in doing like AA work, you've you've done you've gone down the, all this stuff before. And I'm just curious, like, uh, how you'd compare that to the psychedelic experience. Uh, there's definitely some crossover. Um, I, I had the most profound experiences I had outside of psychedelics was with pranayama, different pranayama techniques. And, um, later in the practices, we, we were incorporating, um, cannabis smoke and pranayama and, um, some of those experiences were uh, approaching on the psychedelic, but I've never had um, an experience for meditation. And I might be, you know, what Dal Malachi with the this Sophian Gnostic tradition, he calls it a hard case. They use psychedelics or uh, he suggests, I guess, that psychedelics can be used for hard cases who can't attain these visions and experiences on their own. And, you know, I may be one of those hard cases because I've I've never really gotten any uh, just what I would call a profound result from any spiritual practice or prayer or meditation aside from pranayama, which I did have some really incredible results with pranayama. Hmm. But, and, and, but the cross the crossover is it's not to say that you that it, they're, they're not similar because they're. Like, for example, um, uh, uh, when meditating, um, you, you might have an experience of uh, complete dissolution of self and, um, and you know, merging with o the, the all and have this experience of oceanic bliss. You know, I've heard people talk about that. I have had that experience on LSD, um, and I've had a suspicion when meditating that, Oh, this, we're all one. That this is illusion of separateness. But the difference is the profundity of the experience, because it's like um, with the psychedelic experience, it's it's what McKenna called terrifyingly real. And even if it's not terrifying, it's uh, the word is used to, for the uh, intensity of it. There's no questioning it. There's no escape from it when you're going through it you are going through it and there's no saying oh this isn't real i'm on a drug um because it doesn't matter if you're on a drug when you're realizing something of that profundity uh the drug is insignificant at that point just like the you know the meditation is insignificant and i know people do purport those kinds of experiences and i feel like they're possible but you know i have to admit i've, I've never had any success with them hmm. In the Occult of Personality membership section, Danny Newman and I continue the interview discussing the evidence supporting his conclusions about entheogenic symbolism within Masonic ritual. And specifically, we talk more about his upcoming book, Alchemically Stoned, The Sprig of Acacia, and The Psychedelic Secret of Freemasonry. Don't miss that excellent conversation. Just go to occultapersonality.net slash membership 
and sign up if you haven't already. It's the best way to support the podcast while receiving access to a tremendous amount of additional exclusive content. Thanks again for listening, and until next time.